You're listening to News Talk Radio Guyana 103.1 FM and Damarara Waves Online News. The time in Guyana, 18 hours 30 or 6 30 p.m. At this time, we are pleased to bring you that uh, scheduled discussion with the Attorney General of Guyana, Mr. Anil Landilal, on his perspectives on the proposed amendments to Guyana's Representation of the People Act. As you know, the March 2, 2020 general and regional elections were marred in controversy over especially the recount process in Region 4 and overall the uh, concerns about validity of the elections and ballots and so on. Last evening, we spoke with the leader of the Alliance for Change, Mr. Kamrat Dramjitan, and the chairman of a new and united Guyana, Senior Council Jonas, about essentially their perspectives on the proposed amendments. This evening, we are honored to have the Attorney General. Uh, Attorney General, thank you for joining us in this program. And essentially, we'll be looking at what are some of the thoughts behind the amendments that you have proposed and the government of Guyana has circulated with the stakeholders. So once again, Mr. Landelau, welcome to the program. And first, what essentially is behind these uh, these proposed amendments? I know I did share with you an overall perspective about what occurred in the last elections and some of the concerns, not only by your party, but of course by the coalition, which also had claimed that more than 40 boxes had been tainted with irregularities. So here now, tell us what's the context from your party's perspective and the government's perspective. Thank you very much, Dennis, for inviting me to be part of your program this evening and permit me to say good evening to your viewers and listeners across Guyana and further afield. Um, Dennis, you know that law by its very nature must be constant and must be dynamic. These are inalienable characteristics of the law. The Representation of the People Act was enacted in Guyana in 1964. That is over half of a century ago. And it was inherited from Great Britain, largely inherited from Great Britain, from a legislation that was enacted in that country about 50 years before that. So in total, this piece of legislation that is the subject of reform is approximately a hundred or more years old. That by itself, without more, is the basis for reform. There is no law enacted a hundred years ago that can adequately govern a society a hundred years thereafter. So that's the first point I wish to make. Secondly, the process of reform has been, as you are well aware, and as the public is well aware, has been precipitated by a series of unprecedented events which ensued the March 2nd general and regional elections. These, event, these events attracted international attention and were regarded as acts of grave public notoriety. Guyana was on the brink of collapse as a nation state. Democracy was on trial. Our constitution was on trial. The rule of law was on trial. The will of the people was being hijacked. One commentator beautifully described the process as the most transparent attempt to steal an election witnessed in modern history. Fortunately, due to international pressure, due to local pressure, due to internationalization, due to pressures brought to bear from every conceivable corner of this society, and as a result of judicial intervention, 
the will of the people was respected, democracy was restored, and the valid election results as expressed by the people in this, by the ballots were declared as the final result and the government elected installed. During that process and after that process was concluded, the People's Progressive Party and the People's Progressive Party government, beginning with the president at the helm and several leaders, the general secretary on behalf of the party, and many other political leaders, made a commitment to civil society that once the dust is settled, one of the one of the important uh, endeavors that will be pursued by the government was to strengthen our democratic machinery, strengthen our electoral machinery, examine the law, and attempt to rectify whatever loopholes there may be, whatever ambiguities there are to correct those ambiguities, to clarify them. Wherever there are discretions which we saw being abused, to curtail those discretions. And we witness firsthand, as you said in the prefatory remarks of this program, we witnessed firsthand how the system was abused, how the machinery was uh, manipulated, and how the law was perverted. We undertook and we promised that we will address those issues specifically. Why? To guard, to strengthen our democracy to strengthen the rule of law, to strengthen our constitutional structures and organs, and to ensure that our electoral machinery is strong, is durable, is transparent, is accountable, and can continue to inspire the confidence of the populace. Nothing is more important for an electoral machinery than that it must enjoy the confidence of the electorate in the society in which that uh, machinery has to function. No one who is interested in democracy, who is serious about the rule of law, who has Guyana's interest at heart will oppose the principles which inspired these amendments. One may have disagreements with certain aspects of the amendments, and that is understandable, that is acceptable, that is how a democracy functions, and that is the reason why we have consultation. But if you are going to part company with us on the basis of the reasons that inspired this exercise, then I don't believe that such a person has Guyana at heart. I don't think such a person is interested in democracy. I don't think such a person is interested in an election results reflecting the will of the people. So, uh, Dennis, those are what I will predicate as my opening remarks in terms of putting this, these sets of amendments in the perspective that they should be put in terms of why we have gone this road or this route. AG, one of the concerns that has been raised is why didn't the government use the Law Reform Commission that was recently established to push through these uh, amendments so that you can use the required expertise and, and uh, the government can now sit back and say, okay, well, here is what you propose. And in so doing, it may achieve a wider degree of public consensus rather than the perception being in some quarters that it is the government that is trying to ram this down the throats of the opposition. First of all, let me say, Dennis, that 
any reasonable person would conclude that the current opposition, currently constituted, would have an objection to this exercise. Why? Because they were the perpetrators of the wrongs that these these legit these amendments are seeking to address so most naturally their natural inclination will be an instinctive opposition to these reforms i understand that and and, and, and everyone should understand that the ap and new afc will never welcome this they have a history pnc in particular the main party in the APNU have a history of electoral perversity and electoral rigging and electoral fraud. In fact, the, the data is there, the empirical evidence is there. I don't think we should dispute that at this forum. So anything, and that obviously is still part of their political repertoire and weaponry as we witnessed and the world witnessed during that five months period, it is still part of their pol politics, rigging of elections. So any attempt that would thwart that kind of activity or exercise will naturally attract opposition from I, those- I hear, you, I hear you at that point, but I want to know yes. why is it you didn't use the law so reform I'm, I'm, I'm getting as a there. mechanism? I'm, get, I'm getting there. So what did the PPP as a political party first, and then the government promised to be the driving force in this reform? There was at one time when international agencies attempted to, and uh, the government made it clear that this was a commitment that the government made. In any country in the world, Dennis, law reform, is generally driven by a government. Yes, we have a law reform commission. It's a few weeks old. It has no capacity. And you can call, I can pause here, and I can give you the chairman of the law reform commission's number and all the members. And you can call them now and let the public hear them tell you whether they have the capacity to execute the type of undertaking of there are amendments that is the subject of these discussions. The law reform will play its role at an appropriate time when it has received the maturity that it requires. Right now it is in its embryonic stages. You can't give a baby to do a man's job. In terms of experience, the, our government and our party have experienced personnel, knowledgeable personnel, who have participated in more elections than personnel in any other party in Guyana. I heard it said last night on your program that Lowenfield is, 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 is an expert in electioneering and um, Gokul Budu is an expert in electioneering. Maybe they are. But we have in our party and in our government persons who are equally qualified and perhaps more experienced because we have participated in every election in this country since 1953 when electoral politics on a, on a mass base was introduced into Guyana. So that is how I will answer that question, Mr. Mr. Chabrol. AG, one of the other issues that has popped up is the rationale for breaking up Region 4 into sub-districts. Only today, uh, the, an executive member of the People's National Congress Reform, Mr. Aubrey Lorton, said that this was a plan being hatched by your party and government to rig future elections because now it will lead to the creation of more parliamentary seats. Uh, why would you why would you want to break up first of all why would you want to break up region four into four sub districts dennis in your preambulatory remarks 
you made reference to what transpired after the March 2nd elections. You and I know that the controversy erupted in relation to the tabulation of the results of Region 4. Not in relation to Region 10, not in relation to Region 1, 6, 5, 4, or 2, or um, 5 or 2. It was in relation to Region 4. That's the first thing. Secondly, Region 4 is the most populous region. And it's unfortunate. When I say populous, I mean populous compared to the other regions of Guyana. But it's of picayune size when one compares it with other electoral districts in the world. When you speak about countries like the United States of America and India, etc., it's a drop in the ocean, unfortunately. Unfortunately. It's counting of the votes, just a few thousand threw the entire country into chaos, and we know what happened. It's Region 4, Dennis. And if we are going to address the issues that arose, and if we are going to reform the law in relation to, the, to addressing the problems that arose, then we have to look closely at District 4. Let me assure you, Dennis, that the division of Region 4 into sub-districts, one and, and all the other um, proposed amendments, none of them are intended to give any political party an electoral advantage. Aubrey Norton should be the last person to speak about election rigging. He very shortly may be the victim himself of election rigging in an impending event. We will hear about that shortly. So Mr. Norton, unfortunately, has no qualifications nor moral standing to speak about elections rigging. That's the first thing. Mr. Norton has advanced no other, no reason, no sensible reason for his contention that the subdivision and four will, will, will somehow cause rigging of the elections. All he says is that the, sub, the mere subdivision, according to him, will cause electoral rigging. Well, it's difficult for one to intelligently respond to such vacuous So until remains the same number of seats. We didn't create more than one district. We, we kept the district as one. And we simply subdivided. And that is to answer Mr. Jonas's question to you last night, or a point that Jonas was making last night. Jonas' argument was, by dividing the thing into four divisions, we are creating more bureaucracy. And his recommendation was, we should have created four new districts. How does that make sense? Which one is more demo bureaucratic? Four three additional electoral districts or divide one into four. You still have one district and the seats that are allocatable based upon votes cast remain the same for that one district. So Mr. Norton's contention is completely misconceived and as I said, vacuous. He has no reasoning and logic to support the argument that he has advanced. So um, he also says that if you're going to just be dividing the region into sub-districts for a matter of counting convenience, 
why not establish four different centralized counting centers in each sub-district? Is that a workable idea? Well, look, I, 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 in, my, in my program at uh, NCN, I made it very clear that we in the government, we don't pretend to have a monopoly of knowledge. We don't pretend to have a monopoly of what is right. We have put forward our version. These are our recommendations. The other side and civil society and the political parties out there, they have been given copies. We are now engaged in a consultative exercise. As, demo, as, as a democracy, this is how we act in government. We don't impose. I see Alexander, Vincent Alexander, write a long letter in the papers expressing a fear that recommendations may not be taken on board. Well, I don't know on what platform He's, he's premising that fear. But it is open for recommendations to come in. And we are going to have exchanges. And we are going to have, that is, irreconcilable differences. And when those occur, the manner of resolving those irreconcilable differences is by the methodology of voting in the National Assembly. So we have put our version, our recommendations out. But I wish to assure you that there is no sinister motive and these are not in any form or fashion designed to enhance the political fortunes of any political party. Certainly, not the People's Progressive Party. And Dennis, of all the criticisms that I have heard, I have not heard a single criticism in which a single provision of these amendments have been identified and flagged as an amendment that can create an advantage over the PPP or for the PPP. And that is significant. And I believe that that is the litmus test here. If the, thing, if the accusation is that it has come from us, and somehow that by, that by itself can be wrong, we are the government. We promise this. We are the government. We have to take laws to the parliament. That is the conventional role of the executive government. If you want to fault us in, in this instance, you have to show that the recommendations that we are propelling create in our favor some electoral advantage. They have abysmally failed to point that out. And that, I believe, Dennis, is fundamental. And that demonstrates the objective and dispassionate nature of these recommendations. Why why such hefty fines and uh, uh, sentences? We're talking here about, uh, for instance, life sentences, fines of up to $10 million. I've done some research and I've not come with any other country that has such severe penalties for electoral offenses. Why? All right. So, Dennis, as Bruce Golding said, the former prime minister of Jamaica, he has never seen such a transparent attempt or such transparent attempts to rig an election as he saw in Guyana. Analyze that statement. It means that the vulgarity that we witnessed in that five month period has never been seen before. The 28 years of rigging where two thirds majority was won in about three elections by the PNC. Such magnitude of rigging has never been seen in the world. In the 1985 election, 
the PPP got nine seats out of 65. That mammothness of rigging has never been seen in any part of the world. So I say that to you, to say to you that Guyana, when it comes to elections, we are different, my brother. We are different. There is no returning officer on planet Earth that has behaved, ever behaved, the way that our returning officer for District 4 behaved in relation to the March 2nd election. There is no chief elections officer on planet Earth in the history of electoral politics that behaved as how our elections officer, chief elections officer behaved. So we are unique. That's the first point I want to make. So you can't look in the Caribbean for comparison. You can't look in the Commonwealth for comparison because you can't find comparative rigging and fraud in anywhere in the Caribbean or the Commonwealth of the magnitude and nature and vulgarity that we saw here. So that's the first point. The second point then is. Before you go, I'd just like to let our listeners know on the point of the allegations of electoral fraud that these are matters before the court and no one has yet been uh, convicted of any such offense. Go ahead, AG. Yes. So the second point I want to make, when an election is rigged and the party that the government, that the party that the people elect is prevented from forming a government, you know what is the effect of that? That is analogous to a, a lawful government being overthrown by tyrants. That is the legal analogy that I want to draw. When the democratic will of the people is denied and those who are not elected are imposed as a government, it is akin to a coup d'etat unlawfully. When that happens, persons who commit those types of offenses are charged with offenses of treason and related offenses. Do you know what is the penalty for that? Death. Death is the penalty for treason. That's the second argument I want to advance. The third argument I want to advance, Dennis, is that it is there to, it is a, Law must have a deterrent effect. Punishment must have a deterrent effect. If you're doing nothing wrong, why do you want to rig an election? Why do you want to participate in an illegality? Why? Why do you want to interfere with the will of the people? Why do you want to pervert the electoral machinery? Dennis, these things affect, we see, we see, we saw in Guyana, we lived through the, in Guyana, the degradation and destruction that flowed from the absence of democratically held elections. Dozens of, thousands of families were destroyed. Guyana was pauperized. What happened with a $5 million fine if a person is found attempting to put Guyana back in that state? destroy so many hundred thousands of lives, destroy so many young people's future. You don't think life imprisonment is an appropriate penalty? I think so. But again, that is not the final um, position. That may be my view. The consultations and the, 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 the political majority can change that. But that is why it is out there for consultation, that is. Uh, AJ, one of the concerns being raised, though, uh, in relation to a number of the offenses that are being proposed, offenses and penalties, is that it is not structured in such a way to give people the leverage to argue their position, even before a court of law, to, to the extent to show that it was either intentional or not. Uh, we're talking about loyally committing such offenses. The law does not provide for that. The proposal. Dennis, I, I heard Mr. Jonas raise that argument and Mr. Ramjetan, who came on your program and clearly did not read the amendments, and that is my frank observation with the greatest of respect.
to Mr. Ramjita. Parroted what Mr. Jonas said. Mr. Jonas put forward an argument that some of, well, I don't know how many, but he said that he, um, he looked at some of the offenses and they were what you call strict liability offenses. Now, let me, let me briefly explain, uh, Dennis, that a, a crime consists of two elements, the mental element and the act of the act of doing the act itself. So you have what is called mens rea and actus reus. And it's the coming together of those two that a crime is committed. So a man must have the mental element, the intention to do the act, and then he must do the act. Only when the two coincides, then you have a crime. I have looked at the series of offenses. I have them here. And I can't, honestly, I can't find where, what Mr. Jonas is talking about. Now, let me tell you how strict offenses operates. Strict offenses, first of all, it's on the decline because the policy of the law is that a crime, a man must not be convicted of a crime unless he has the intention to commit the act. And that's the policy of the law. So wherever, for example, a statute is silent on intention, the, 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 the tribunal is empowered in law to read intention as a requirement of the statute. So, and there are certain offenses where it is inseparable. Intention and the act is inseparable. So you, you are found with cocaine in your pocket. How can you possibly say that you didn't intend to have cocaine in your pocket? In the ordinary course of things, a man is taken to know what is in his pocket. So in that such a case, the intent and the act goes together. Now, there is no such uh, juridical offense here in these volumes. I can't find one. But I don't have a problem, Dennis, where knowingly can be inserted to insert it if it is to make it clear that intent is required. Naturally, intent is required for all these, um, for all these offenses. It goes without saying. It's a very narrow category of offenses which do not require mens rea. And it is most times possession offenses. So I, I don't buy that argument. But if it is that there are instances where words like knowingly can be inserted, in principle, Dennis, I have no objection to that. That's good lawmaking. If it can make the offense clear and help the arbiter and adjudicator who will have to interpret this law makes it easier for them, then that's okay. But I know that the law says that you must always have intention, and when it is absent in the express language, then one is free to infer it, that it is a requirement. Are you worried, though, that these stiff penalties may serve as a deterrent to people wanting to take up some of these posts, even with the best of intentions? This elections is a serious business and you have to have responsible persons and persons who are committed, dedicated and diligent. Persons who are working this system must understand that they don't, they can't behave as though they have a stake in the race. They are the system they are administering the process. They are not a participant. Though they are voters, their larger role are facilitators. So I hope, it is my hope and expectation that it will not have that effect because I believe that a large number of our people who are employed in the process they behave themselves. And I hope that they will want to behave themselves. And that is, we have many, many draconian laws in this country. You have money laundering law that carry death penalty. Your house can be seized. Your vehicles can be seized. Your bank account frozen. By, by, by just, by ex parte, 
by a, a, a somebody going to the court and get all these orders against you. But you're not worried, are you? And that is? That is, are you worried? Well, I, I, it's not a matter of worried. It's a matter of people looking at this from a political perspective. Well, no, no. well this has nothing to do with politics, my friend. This has to do with ensuring our democratic processes are intact, that our machinery is working, and that it remains strong, and it must not be easily penetrated by miscreants. And I think that's the aspiration of every society to have such an electoral system and machinery. One, in one of your early interviews, I believe, on the Sato National Communications Network here in Guyana, you essentially stated that this entire uh, raft of amendments is to essentially trace the, the ballot from the time it is cast to the point of declaration. That's just my uh, precy of what you had said in part. Could this have been done simply by only amending the representation of the People Act to provide for the posting of the statements of poll online. And that in itself would have, would have served as a deterrent to anyone wanting to take any step to possibly falsify any of the results. Dennis, I, I, I wish, I wish if that singular act or amendment or that singular set of amendments could have cured the deficiency. I wish. The statements of poll were posted by the PPP. We called upon GCOM to post it. They had it in their possession and they were not counting it. Are you going to, then seriously, as Attorney General and given instructions to examine what transpired there and to spearhead a process to address it with law reform. Are you not going to address the conduct of the chief elections officer who tabulated, who refused to tabulate the results of the recount? Simply refuse and then begun, begun an exercise of determining what is valid and what is not valid votes? And how can you leave that area of the law with those discretion unchecked? You can't. You would be irresponsible. How can you not address, my friend, the question of what should be the basis for the tabulation of results when they come in? How can you not address that as bed sheet and a spreadsheet cannot be used? That you must use the statements of poll as the basis for the tabulation. And that is why I made the point that the golden thread that runs through these reforms is to ensure the ballot that entered the box is the ballot that is reflected in the final results. That is why I said that. And all these amendments were designed to create this chain, this inseverable chain that must not have any break in nexus as it runs from the ballot box to the declaration of the final results by the chairman of the elections commission that you is what of, this is intended to do you you talk though about uh having in possession the statements of poll and wanting gcom to uh, disclose them at the last election but here now is a suggestion that your amendment that an amendment for the mere posting of those statements of poll on a gcom website will essentially solve all of these issues that you're seeking to address no no it will solve one these there is uh, these amendments are in in a group they are in a cluster one can't pluck out one and say that it will solve the problem i don't think so they are a collection of amendments that were considered to be appropriate to address the collective malady which we saw afflicting the system for five long months. And um, couldn't you have instead given um, leverage to the Elections Commission 
to uh, determine the amount of, of voters, the number of voters in any given area, rather than putting it in the law, given the fact that, you know, the population distribution may decrease or increase depending on, you know, this economic and socioeconomic circumstances of the country. Why put a fixed figure in the law? No, if you look at it, it's not a, it's, it's a no less than, a no more than, sorry. It's no more than, you can have less. And then is that is designed to specifically address the issue of what I considered to be, what I saw and interpreted during the last elections as a deliberate strategy to affect PPP strongholds by limited number of polling stations that would have kept voters in the line for long periods to make them disenchanted. That is what that was designed to. Dennis, let me tell you, as a, a two days or three days before March the 2nd, on the east coast of the Marara, where I have responsibility, we did not know where the polling stations are. The people did not know where the polling stations are. We were still going night night with GCOM and the uh, opposition, the then government party, into the villages to identify places for polling stations. Here we have the polling stations must be named and identified long before elections. And they must be strategically located so that they are, make easy access to the people and voting must be done in a comfortable and convenient way. You don't have to go line up in the hot sun. You must go there, vote, and move on. Our democracy must become comfortable, not burdensome and, 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 and a war zone, as we are accustomed to. Person must, be feel, must feel safe, comfortable, and, 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 and they must feel that their integrity is intact when they go to, 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 to cast a ballot. They must not be looking over their shoulder and see who and how many people in the, you got to really you're harassed. I had to go and distribute you had to election day, people really needed help because of the way that the polling stations were laid out. These these amendments, my friend, are intended to address those issues for every political party, my friend. No voter in Guyana should be waiting in the line for one hour to vote or two hours in hot sun on a tarmac, uh, uh, bitumen tarmac. You only heat penetrating 90 degrees Fahrenheit. People are fainting on elections day. This is intended to address that, my friend. And as I said, it's across the political divide. I, I was about to ask you whether uh, it was coming out of the People's Progressive Party's experience, specifically for its supporters, that uh, you decided to include this particular amendment. Which particular amendment? Sorry. To, uh, to ensure that uh, the, the polling stations are in areas and you have, uh, you have uh, that, numbers of... That, that, that is a national responsibility and... Uh, a legal duty of the GCOM to ensure that every citizen of every political party have a fair opportunity and a reasonable opportunity and a comfortable opportunity of exercising his or her franchise, whichever political party that voter wishes to vote for. It's a constitutional right that he's going to exercise and he must be afforded fair and adequate opportunities and facilities to be able to exercise that right as a human being and with decency and in comfort. Our people are not entitled to that? I think so. Why, uh, to what extent uh, in formulating these amendments, uh, Mr. Nandalal, did you have any sort of initial discussions with the Guyana Elections Commission? Or was it solely on the basis of the experiences coming out of the March 2, 2020 elections? Dennis, the way legislation largely are drafted is that they emanate from the government, the executive government, and they go to stakeholder organizations for their input in a consultative process. 
this legislation traveled that conventional route, is traveling that conventional route. You, we don't put the horse before the cart. We have proposals out there and all of the stakeholders, all of the important players have an opportunity to look at the amendments and to make their contribution. Please don't forget that, and, and we cannot be oblivious to the fact that GCOM was also part of this problem that lasted for nine, six months. GCOM was also part of the problem. Did, did it, this this did, thing here, we, we must, we, this thing is not a, a thing that we should polish over and we should varnish. This thing here, we must face the reality of what we all witnessed. I don't know why people are trying to use all kinds of manipulative language not to recognize what we all saw. You made a, an important intervention that somebody has not been yet found guilty. I don't need a court to find a person guilty when I witness what I witnessed. There's a different process altogether in the court. But I know what I witnessed as a human being. I was part of the process. There's nobody who can convince me otherwise. But I am not the tribunal authorized. So my views doesn't matter. And I'm not part of the process that, that, in which I, that, 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 that system is engaged. That's why there is independence. Did any of you, the People's Progressive Party's elections commissioners uh, have any role to play in, in these amendments? Dennis, as I said to you, this, these amendments have been sent to GCOM. They are being considered by GCOM, they are being considered by civil society, they are, going, they are being considered by the political parties out there. They came, they, they were, you, you heard how they were prepared. I was just, what I'm trying to gather from you is, um, I understand what you're saying about mm. the role of the government and so on, but I'm trying to draw the possibility of whether the experiences of at least half of the commission were drawn upon to, as part of your input into the crafting of the proposed amendments. I am not sure what role they played, if any. I'm not sure. And how do you foresee this consultative process going? Face to face, back and forth correspondence, um, email. Um, my my so my my, my colleague or my just colleague, no, my colleague El Tishira, who is responsible for parliamentary affairs, is um, charged with the responsibility of carrying out that exercise. So you, in terms of process, Mr. Shearer should be asked to speak on that. OK, and are, uh, we touched on various aspects of, of the proposed amendments this evening, but are there orders you consider to be rather critical in the entire web of, of amendments to ensure that uh, overall everything uh, meshes together in one complete whole? that you would like to single out? Well, um, apart, what I would like to say is that apart from these amendments, um, there is another set which will come very shortly to deal with the issues of registration. That is also a problematic issue. Registration and the list and so on. Whether we have cyclical registration, whether we have house-to-house -house registration, can you throw in a database, stop the machinery, and, and begin all over again. And importantly, Dennis, our law, our laws in relation to elections generally, and in particular in relation to registration, is scattered and diverse and in a, in a terribly disorganized state. Some of the laws have been overtaken by events some of them have been impliedly repealed by subsequent legislation. I don't know if you are following one of the cases. Chief Justice George uh, went at great length to lament in one of her rulings the disorganized and disarray state that the electoral laws are in in Guyana. So 
that is another component of this exercise which we will be speaking about shortly once the proposals are out remember we said that we are going to review from the registration of the elector to the declaration of the final results the entire gamut of statutory provisions election then is, is a statutory process every step of the way is the subject of a statutory provision in chronological order i heard mr um, mr jonas says that it's a very very complex thing to understand it's not you just you know the, the legislation may be a little cumbersome and that's why we are trying to simplify it as i said to you it's a hundred years old it's a hundred years old so by sheer passage of time, by sheer age, it requires a review. Any preliminary thoughts, though, on how the removal of the names of deceased persons can be done in the no, I set, don't want to, broader set of uh, proposed amendments? No, no, that is, I don't want to, to be uh, premature. I prefer that the amendments are out and um, they, are, they, they, are, they are approved and then, then out and then we can discuss it. Please appreciate that. Yes. Um, and any time frame, though, when that will be out? That should be um, definitely within two weeks of today. Yeah, within two weeks, I think that should be out. Uh, what does, uh, just going back a bit on, on this, uh, on the whole thought processes about the uh the representation of the people after the chief elections officer and so on any idea about how you think the appointment process should go i know gcom is an independent body constitutionally and has the remit to make uh whatever procedures and so on uh if it, it sees a fit for the appointment or the removal of persons but do you have any thoughts of your own about how perhaps such a person should be appointed what criteria should be used um, I, I don't want to comment on the process that GCOM should use. I see a lot of persons are commenting on it. I hope that it is a process that will inspire trust. Because that's the big deal here. Whether the populace trusts GCOM, there's a big public confidence issue here. So whatever process is arrived at, it must be one that inspires the trust and confidence of the populace, the public. Obviously, it must be transparent, it must be fair, and it must be based upon merit. Merit. Meritocracy can be an unruly horse. But once you jump on that horse, it will take you to the right destination. And those are, to me, the fundamental tenets that any process employee should embrace. Attorney General Alan Nanla speaking with us this evening about the uh, implications for of the proposed amendments to the Representation of the People Act. Uh, quickly before we go, AG, any final thoughts, any points you'd like to stress and emphasize before you wrap up this evening's program? I want to take this opportunity, Dennis, to invite every single Guyanese to get a copy of these amendments and try to acquaint themselves with them, to make a contribution, make a suggestion, make a recommendation. I encourage every organization to do that. Don't look at this thing with any prejudice and preconceived notions they're not intended to harbor those they were not intended to have that kind of impact look at them dispassionately look at them objectively and work with us to help us strengthen our democracy that is what this is in this is about this is not about ppp this is about making guyana good and guyana strong we all saw Dennis. We all saw the possibility of how close we were perched on that dangerous precipice for three months. 
no no guy no Guyanese should want to see their country in that state ever again. No political leader who has this country at heart would ever want to see Guyana there. This is one of the main reasons that can put us back there. So work with us. This is a com consultative process. I want to believe that it will be responsive and responsible and that sensible and constructive recommendations will be taken seriously. Those are my closing remarks, Dennis. One quick point before you go, AG. In the proposed amendments, uh, do you envisage the need for a clear definition of what is a valid vote? Dennis, I don't want to, at this point in time, make any definitive statement that on any issue, we are going to have a con I have a preconceived conclusive position. Then that would defeat the exercise. The I exercise know, but in the in the in the, um, in the in the proposed amendments, there is no clear definition of what is a valid vote. So I'm asking if you envisage that as something that you may wish to consider including. If that comes out in the recommendations and a case is made out for it, then certainly. It is an issue that one should consider um, with some seriousness because it, it is an issue that arose. But we have to also understand that what is a, what is a, a valid vote is a question for determination by the courts. And the law must be careful and the executive and the legislature in passing laws must be careful that, that they do not trespass upon the functional province of the judiciary. That is what the chief elections office attempted to do. And that is what Justice Singh herself, in a letter and in an opinion during the process said, cannot be done. It can only be done by a court. So those are very thorny issues. It's not that I'm not, we have not addressed our minds to it. But there are thorny issues that, you know, you don't want to trespass on the province of the court and you try to determine when, you know, the law, there is a, there is a whole set of a body of case law in terms of what is a valid vote. Attorney General, thank you very much for joining us here in this uh, discussion on the implications of the proposed amendments to representation of the People Act, giving you an opportunity essentially to respond to some of the um, the positions that were taken last night and, and earlier today by um, the leader of the Alliance for Change, Mr. Kamrat Ramchitan, the chairman of a new United Guyana, Mr. Timothy Jonas, and as I said earlier today, by executive member of the People. National Congress Reform, Mr. Aubrey Norton. Once again, thank you very much, and we look forward to talking with you again as other uh, proposed amendments emerge as part of the electoral reform here in Guyana. Thank, thank you very much, Dennis.